Leonard Day and Arnold, and we can remember that it's real techy stuff. And we started a group, me and a guy named, uh, his last name was Fritz, I can't remember, it was, uh, Gary Fritz. Uh, we started a group called all dot biz dot multi dash level. So that was like the first news group ever on the internet. And that's because I had all this time from 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. So we started all dot biz dash multi level. And so, so, it was me and Gary. I'm like, wow, this is great. So we chatted, and he lives somewhere in Ohio. And I'm really? like, I'm in Charlotte, so great. And then somebody else joined, and then this lady named Astrid Merrick from Amsterdam joined, and she's like, I do network marketing. And I'm like, oh, cool, nice to meet you, Astrid. And, and slowly but surely, this little group turned into 50 or 80 or 100 network marketers from who knows where. And I became really good friends with them because I had most of the time that all of them there. And I had internet access. And then one of them said, oh, by the way, there's a publication called Upline Magazine. I said, Upline Magazine, that sounds interesting. How do I get a subscription? They said, well, we're not really sure. We can't find their number anywhere on the publication, but there's an address. An address in, uh, it was 1402 East Jefferson Street. No, 402 East Jefferson Street. So I'm like, East Jefferson Street? And then he said, Charlottesville, Virginia. Charlottesville, Virginia? That's where I was going to school. That was my town. I said, isn't that interesting? Charlottesville, Virginia. So what I did is I said, oh, let me go over there the next day. I walk over to 402 East Jefferson Street, open the door, nobody inside downstairs. I hear noises upstairs, I walk up the steps, I go upstairs, and there's two customer service reps. They're answering the phone, Jen, and they're both having their names for Jen. And then uh, I go to the office, and I say, so is the boss here? They say, oh yeah, he's uh, I think down on the, on, the, on the mall. You have to wait for him. I said, okay, I'll wait for him. So I'm sitting there waiting for him. And, and through the door comes a guy named John Milton Fogg. How many of you know John Milton Fogg, right? He wrote a book called The Greatest Networker in the World. It's like, I had no idea what that book was. And I looked at him, and I said, Hey, I do network marketing. I hear this publication is about network marketing. He said, yes it is. Who are you? What do you want? <laughs> he said, what do you want? I said, a job. He looked around and said, what can you do? Not much. <laughs> but I'll do whatever you want me to do. Right? Um, and he hired me. It was one of the greatest things that happened to me. So I was able to, from that point forward, eventually run the customer service department. I was able to run their events business. I was able to run their warehousing business. Uh, but what happened during that is they put on an event called the Master Seminar. And it was in Reno, Nevada. And I've never been to Reno, Nevada. And John Fox said, oh, we've got a guy that uh, writes for us and works for us for offline in Australia named Mark Davis. Uh, so you and Mark are in charge of putting on the event in Reno. Well, um, I never run an event. <laughs> Doesn't matter, you're going. So I fly to Reno. I meet Mark Davis in Reno, Nevada. We've got the hotel, so I've got to do the hotel check, the room check. Everything, we finally get a, uh, a room, and all the speakers show up in the room for that event. And amongst the speakers was Randy Gage, so I was like, wow, you know, meeting Randy Gage, that was cool. John Milton Fogg was there, some guy named Tom Schreider was there, that was Big Al. And I'm looking for Big Al, he's ready to come to the door. Where, where's the big, who's this little guy? <laughs> oh, big Al. <laughs> big Al walks through the door, we had a couple other speakers there, Sandy and so forth, and then, Door opens, you know, we're waiting for one more speaker because we're gonna have a speaker's meeting. The door opens up and this blonde comes through the door and then there's this big guy, big smile on his face. He said, all right, I'm here with the mean shark. And he jumps on the bed in the, in the room. Just jumps on it like it's his. I'm looking at that and I realize that's, oh, that's the guy that wrote a book called Mach 2 with your hair on fire. But it wasn't called Mach 2 with your hair on fire then because it was a little gray pamphlet at the time. It was still an idea, but I've read it. I had one of my jobs was to review books and so forth. And I wrote, how many of you have read that? Mark to the Air on Fire, right? You had to write your vision. And as I reviewed the book, I wrote out my vision, and I just put it away. You heard the similar story here today from Damon. And a couple of years later, I pulled that vision out. And you know what? 80% of the stuff came true. And I thought to myself, oh, what a moron I am. I should have put more than 45 minutes of thought into that. <laughs> I mean, I was just doing it to review the book. It was a manuscript at the time. Well, interestingly enough, this gentleman, he gave a presentation that day. He uh, helped uh, give Mark Arnell uh, the Network Mark of the Year Award. And uh, I was uh, entirely intimidated by him. I mean, I kid you not. This guy, you know, he shook my hand and my whole body shook. <laughs> I was like, wow. I thought he was from Texas or something. He's a huge personality. And he's 
share from the stage absolute truths. He didn't sugarcoat it. He said it with authority and with passion, and, and he just became this, this hero for me. And over the years, he was uh, kind enough to reach out to me every once in a while and say, Hey, Art, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? And I, for some reason, would just pour out to him. And then he'd give me advice back. And to this day, it's been like that. Just last week, we had a call for about an hour and a half. And at the, towards the end of the car, he's like, All right, I got, I got to tell you a couple of things. He's like, It's going to be, you know, it might be tough advice for you. And I said, All right. And, and he does that because he's like a father figure to me. He's paternal that way. Uh, but when, I, when he says it, I listen. And I'm hoping that as he comes up here tonight, you uh, give him that same respect, uh, and, and you will, I know, but uh, he's a gentleman that started his, his profession chopping the heads off of chickens uh, for, I don't know, like $2.30 an hour. He went on to become an entrepreneur and ended up on the cover of Success Magazine. He runs a network marketing company that's been in business for 20 years. Uh, if you ever visit their home office, I mean, it's just incredible. And he cares about the distributors. It's almost as if he were a distributor. He hangs out with the DSA. He talk, goes and gets involved and understands the politics. He gets this profession. Like Paul and you know, just in an amazing way on many levels. So what I want you to do is let's warm welcome to Mr. Richard. Have you really been doing that? She said, oh yeah, for sure. Religiously. 
said, I mean, we've gone through like, you know, 100 books already. You sure you want to keep doing this? I said, no, no, no keep, keep doing it. So here's the vision I had. I, I figured, you know, these books, you know, first they're going to be like, you know, a few books in the mail room. And then, you know, two a week after 52 weeks, that's 104 books. This is going to be kind of a pretty big stack. And I don't know why my vision Harpo's mailroom would be kind of like our mailroom, which, you know, it's like 20 by 20 and a bunch of shelves and stuff. So I'm visualizing the books in the mailroom. And I figured, you know, at some point, when the stacks of these books get high enough, like hundreds and hundreds of books, somebody's going to get to, not Oprah, but who's that gal, King, uh, what's her name? Gail King? Yeah. Somebody's going to get to Gail King and say, Hey, what do you want us to do with all these books? <laughs> Somebody's going to get their attention. And uh, so it took, uh, I, 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 I got to go find out exactly, but somewhere between four and a half and five and a half years. <laughs> Two books a week. <laughs> I never asked what it costs. I don't want to know. It's like 800 books. <laughs> Somebody's tripping over these books. And you know what? It worked. I didn't have to hear the note twice a week. They just automatic pilot. They don't kind of like auto responders, I guess. And uh, you know, one day I was down in California. I lived in California in winter, and my, my assistant called and she said, Richard, you're not going to believe it. I said, What? She said, We got a letter from our book. She says, no, it's right here. Well, I really, I, you know, I wanted to see it for myself, but I said, well, read it to me. Harpo Productions. I said, you know, who's the front? Harpo Productions. Right at the top. Dear Mr. Brooke, please cease and desist. <laughs> And you know, it's a rising problem. 
that um, there is an us against them mentality. And if you're relatively new to the industry, you know, maybe for you it only shows up as, you know, a complaint about how things are done or how things are designed. But if you've been around the industry for a while, what the effect has been on you is driving you out of companies and into a new company, which requires telling your whole group, you know what, what I told you for the last five years isn't so for me anymore. And now it's a whole new story, and I want you to follow me here. And it's starting over. And I don't know how many of you have started over, but how many of you have started over at least once? How did it feel? You ever want to do that again? No, you don't. But as long as there's a gap between how we as field leaders, and I do, as uh, Art said, I, I'm kind of a CEO and owner of a company by default. I have the mentality of a field leader. Uh, I, I became the CEO because I didn't like how other people were running companies, so I thought I'd do both, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. But uh, in the, until we close this gap and you understand how companies see this industry and companies see how you see this industry, and we close this gap and we share some values, and we maybe embrace some cultural commitments as an industry, we're gonna have an us against them. And when we have an us against them, here's the kind of things that happen. Companies decide that you're not an independent distributor. Companies decide that even though they're gonna pay you as an independent distributor, how they really wanna treat you as an employee. And what that means is you're gonna do exactly what they say you do and how you do it and when you do it, and if they don't like how you do it, what do they do? They fire you. How many of you have ever been terminated for a from company? Raise your hand and lines up. Yeah. Well, not very many. Let's be a little newbies in here. I got some slides here about some commitments that I'd like to see companies make. And if you like them or you want to add to them or change them, do whatever you want to with them, but Maybe these are commitments that you can hold your companies to as a standard. And one of the ways you can help shape the future of our industry is perhaps next time you're in between companies, which for most of you is going to happen. At some point in another year of your career, you're going to be looking for another company. Maybe make wiser choices. So um, here's some corporate commitments. About that. Here's number one, a commitment to longevity. I just don't see enough companies in our industry who get in the game to be in the game 100 years from now as a network marketing company. They get in the game because they see there's a lot of money to be made. They get in the game perhaps because there's an opportunity to go public and make a lot of money on the stock, but they don't have a long-term vision of Providing a network marketing opportunity for people for 100 years. Now, why 100 years when maybe you and I are only 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and we're only going to be doing this for another 20 or 30 years? Well, the answer is obvious, isn't it? I mean, we're building something for somebody. And if you and I don't have residual income, longevity equals residual income. If you don't have residual income, you don't have asset value. If you build something that pays you five or ten thousand dollars a month, and you can actually at least semi-retire from it, like you can sit on the beach, what's that distributorship worth if somebody would pay you for it? What's it worth as an asset? It pays you five or ten grand a month, whether you work it or not. Somewhere between a million and two million dollars as an asset on your balance sheet. How do you know that? You'd have to have that much real estate or that much liquid investment in equities to get the same return. You get that conversation? Without longevity, there's no residual income. Without residual income, there's no asset value. So it doesn't matter if you make 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 thousand dollars a month, if you don't have longevity, residual income, asset value, all you have is a job. You might as well be a mortgage banker. You might as well sell cars. You might as well sell real estate, because all you have is a job. You're not building a legacy. You're not building an asset. And here's what we know when we've been around a long time. One of the assets of being around a long time, 33 years for me, full time in this industry, is you see things like 50 years coming up on you. Now, if you'd asked me 32 years ago, hey, if you're out for 
important is if you think that uh, everything lasts for the next 30 years. You know what I've said? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, you know. I don't know about that, but uh, this month, my check, please. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been my perspective. And you know, let's keep going for a year because uh, we have contests going on and last for us a year. I'm, I'm looking to win the contest. <laughs> you know, when you're young, you just don't you, you don't think about it. You don't think, you know, maybe you, we think we're going to live forever. We think our business is going to go on forever. We just don't think about 20 or 30 or 40 years is coming. But it is coming. Like a runaway freight train, it's coming. It's going to be 50 years from now. You know, it's a good thing companies like Amway have, I guess, a 100-year business plan because they're 50 years old now. I mean, their 50 years is already gone. It's a good thing they have a 100-year business plan. There'd be nothing to talk about. Right? you got to have a 100-year business plan. So next time you're in between companies or in the company you're in now, next time you get a chance to talk to the owner, say, hey, Tell me about longevity. I know you guys can be all over this one, but you know, this is huge. And uh, the analogy I like here in partnership with sales leaders is, uh, I don't know if it was uh, whoever it was, one of the great marriage counselors or, or one of the great personal development gurus that brought on the distinction of uh, being 100% responsible. Well, the distinction that I was brought up in in responsibility is if you're responsible, it's 100%, 100% in partnerships. Which means that if you're in partnership with somebody, like in a marriage or in a business, and you're going to be responsible to make that partnership succeed, then your 100% is 100%. It's not 50-50. It's not, I'm going to do my part and you do your part. It's not, I'm going to be nice to you and empower you as my spouse and love you as my spouse and take care of you as my spouse, as long as you do, do your part, all your stuff on the list. And as soon as I see you don't start doing some of your stuff, or maybe you have a breakdown in your performance, then I'm going to start to withhold some of my performance. How do marriages work when they're set up 50-50? They don't work. They don't work when they're 50-50. They don't work when they're conditional. They only work when they're 100%, 100%. What that means is, as you're part of the partnership, you have a role to play. You do your 100% regardless of whether your partner does 100%. 100%, 100%. 100%. Companies need this commitment. They need this commitment to honor sales leaders in the field, to listen to them. One of the trends we're on as an industry, you go back 20, 30 years ago, most of the owners and founders of network marketing companies had built a sales organization sometime, somewhere. Today, most of them don't have a clue what you're talking about. They really don't. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean they have bad intentions. They've just never done it. So when Randy's talking about, you know, no, Rick, really, that's a disincentive contest. That, that trick won't work. He's telling the truth. That happens all the time. Companies get together and they get the board group and say, this is and the sales leaders hate it. And you know, when he gets rammed down their throats, how's that work? It doesn't work. <coughs> Number three, corporate commitment. This is a trend I see. You go back 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years ago, you didn't see very many companies develop mediocre, junk, let me see what how cheap I can get by kind of products. We have a trend in the last 20, 30 years. Let me see what I can get by with in the quality of my products. Let me put the money in marketing and packaging and see if I can get by with selling mediocre products. This is a commitment like, I'm shit telling you what I would be telling the owners of companies. And every once in a while I get an, an opportunity to rail on them about this kind of stuff. And here's the most important. To market them legally and responsibly. I'm talking about the company now. Not you. But it's a huge problem we have. You know what happens when companies allow, tolerate, encourage, look the other way when you make drug claims? You know what can happen? You know the regulatory body that can't interfere in that? You know the name of it? What's its initials? 
the FDA. You know, one of the things you may not know about the FDA is the FDA is not required to do its job to go through due process. Not required. Can I tell you a story? 27 years ago, I had a brief, I, I briefly was like for three years, I was asked to run this company. Now I was a, they pulled me out of the field to run it. I was a very happy, very successful distributor, but the company was a mess. Somehow they said, yeah, you can come in here and run it. I didn't know anything about it, but uh, here's something I witnessed happen. I'm in my office one day, and my assistant comes down and said, there's a lady from the FDA here. She, uh, she wants to talk to you. I was the uh, executive vice president or something of the company. So I went down and met her, she had a white smock on. She said, you know, I'm I'm Betty from the FDA, and I'd like to see your warehouse. Well, I didn't know anything. I said, well, okay, the warehouse, back here. Stacks and stacks and stacks, racks of pallets of a nutritional product. Tons of it. We were selling a bull out of it. She had an assistant. They went around through the racks looking at it. They're looking at the labels of the product, which was outside the pallet, all the shrink wrap. She got out these little red tags. She wrote on a little red tag and stapled it to the pallet. Look at her. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, don't wrap, we don't wrap these. We don't sell them like full pallets at the time. We don't wrap these and then ship the boxes, you know, flip to it. We ship these. Distributors order.
What happens when your momentum is over? Fork and butt disease. <laughs> It's a reality. It's just going to happen. 
the company you thought was like for you for the rest of your life when you're 23 years old and all you want to do is pay off your debt, drive a nice car, is not the company necessarily for you when you're on a personal development program and you evolve this person and you're much wiser and you got a different value system and it's five or ten years down the road you're looking for something different, may not be the same company for you. Divorces do happen in our industry. And we got companies that are chasing people, wrecking their lives. Not enough to terminate. I'm a big believer in. You leave my company, you come after my distributors, I'm terminating you. I am not going to pay you to raid my company. Now, I know a lot of you think that's probably a horrible position to take. That's just because you don't own a business like this. If you did, you'd have the same position. But suing people and wrecking their lives because they decide move on, that's not right. But why is it going on? Because we have too big of a gap. We have companies with a value system, we have sales leaders with a value system, it's too big of a gap and it's us against them. And until we narrow the gap, this is gonna continue. Be a leader's commitment. Boy, this is just huge. And I know it doesn't like ring a bell to any of you because you're not in between companies. You're all here engaged and on fire. But ask anybody who's been doing this for 10 years. You probably, in the next 20 years, will be in between companies. What I would just implore you to do is next time, do your homework. Don't just jump in something because you like the product, they got a fancy website, and you like the sponsor, do your homework. You probably know better questions to ask now, like do some due diligence. Number two, marry your company for better or worse. Tom Schreiber is famous for saying, pick the, pick the company you want to have your problems with. Every company's going to have problems. Pick the company that you trust to go back to back and fight those problems with you. And marry them for better or worse. <laughs> now I'll give you a peek at the next slide, then I'm going to back up to this one. Doesn't mean that divorces don't happen. So I'm not saying if the company you're with totally dishonors you, you're not on fire, you're never going to get on fire, you know, at some point, just move on. So what I'm asking you to do is move on with honor, integrity, and generosity. And if that means, that doesn't mean raiding the pre previous downline to build a new, new, new downline. Now this is a very messy, gray, complicated area. Like you move to a new company, you can't stop people from following you. You know, I have an ironclad policy. We don't go after other distributors. But every once in a while, a distributor who's in another company wants to join. You can't keep them out. I mean, I can tell them. Like the pair said, you know, we don't we don't accept leaders from other companies. Great, I can sell them that as the CEO, but that can't keep them out. They can still go sign up. People follow. And that's not your responsibility. Rating is your responsibility. Divorce with honor, integrity, and generosity. And one of the biggest things that's caused a gap in our industry is people that have not done that. And they haven't done it because they don't have enough confidence. They don't have a character, value of uh, honesty and integrity and do the right thing leadership, and they're afraid they can't build fast enough in the new company, they need their own people. That's the mechanism that raids the company. And you and I need to stamp it out of the future of our industry.
doing this. And what I do when people sit in front of me is I say, you know, tell me your story. You're a networker. I, I, I love networker stories, even the horror stories. I take it off of so, you know, them. <laughs> tell me your story. So these are all people, pretty much, that have been doing the business for between 10 and 30 years. And they're sitting in front of me. Why? They're looking for a new deal. These are not new people. These are seasoned veterans in the industry. So I didn't get on to this until after about the third interview, but on about the third or fourth interview, when I'm saying, hey, tell me your story, I got a whiteboard in my office. So when they start telling me your story, I always start, well, tell me the story at the beginning, like, how did you get involved in the business? They say, well, I got involved with, you know, Amway or, you know, Shackley or New Life or in the New Skin or Herbalife or, you know, one of the old established companies. And I put that company up on my whiteboard. And I'd say, well, then what happened? And they'd say, oh, you know, uh, the compensation plan changed, or a newspaper article came out, or my upline did this, or they quit chipping this, or, you know, my cat got sick, or, you know, so, uh, I, I, you know, we all moved over to, you know, company B. So I'd write company B up underneath, you know, Herbalife, or whatever company they started. And this conversation would go on for like an hour, hour long the story went. These people season people 10 to 30 years. Average number of companies, guess how many? 10. Average number of companies, 10. Some of them were in companies they couldn't even remember the name of or the name of the product. They would actually, after they're on like under number seven, they'd go, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you about all back up here, I got a golden. I can't remember what it was. So these long lists. And uh Here's a question that sort of just intuitively came up on the third or fourth interview, and I asked everybody, uh, 52 people, by the way, 52 people we did this with, and I asked them this question. I said, I'm just curious. One of my favorite prefaces. Uh, it's a tip. I believe if you preface your question with, I'm just curious, you can ask people anything you want. <laughs>
franchising industry as an example. Different kind of business model, but I don't think it should compete with us because what's it cost to get involved in a franchise? Minimum, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars all the way up to two or three million dollars, and what are you buying? You're buying a job. Ask anybody that's ever bought one. You pay a million dollars for a McDonald's, you bought a job. You're going to make that franchise successful, you're going to be there 20 hours a day. <coughs> Franchising is buying a job. The franchising industry has been around for 150 years in this country, but it didn't really get popularized until about the same time network marketing did. Kentucky Fried Chicken, in 1944, one of the first companies to actually popularize franchising. You got Burger King back then, McDonald's 1955 or 56. Guess how much total sales volume franchising does compared, compared to network marketing direct sales? Just under a trillion dollars in the United States alone. They, we do 30 billion, they do a trillion. 30 million to a trillion. They are trouncing us in an opportunity that costs hundreds and thousands of dollars to get involved in, and all you do is buy a job. Trouncing us. But you probably heard, in the 60s or 70s, they came within a few votes, a big what? Outlawed as a concept in this country. Completely abolished, against the law, to franchise. Now you see how heavily regulated franchises are? They're heavily regulated. Before you invest in a franchise, that company has to tell you all there is to tell. All the good, the bad, and the ugly. Heavily regulated. We don't get our act together, we're going to be heavily regulated. Every failed and known business that was honorable, the bad ones, I like to get them out of here as fast as possible, but the honorable ones, they just add fuel to the fire to the regulators and the media. We as an industry need to walk on arms in mutual respect. We need more success. We're 30 billion. We could be a trillion. The only way we're going to get from 30 billion to a trillion, to at least have the same respect and clout in this country as the franchising industry, is to lock arms. You don't see McDonald's and Burger King like tearing each other apart like we do. They may advertise against each other, but they don't tear each other apart like we do. When there's an honorable company out there, we need to lock arms and we need to build to a trillion. And it's not going to happen because your company's cool. One company can do it. Your company can't do it. We can do it. There's two things that gotta happen to pull that off. Number one, you as sales leaders, forget about $100,000 a month earner. Most of you here we just love to figure out how to make five or 10 every month. You as sales leaders, you gotta become pro, and that's just not about doing the A grade activities where you're recruiting and making money, you gotta become a professional. You gotta quit taking the shortcuts, quit making drug claims, quit making outlandish income claims, quit raiding each other's companies. You gotta become an ethical, professional leader in this industry, and you gotta hold your companies accountable to do the same thing. And the only way you can hold them accountable is vote with your feet. So, they're not doing the right thing. Find a new so uh, that's my speech for the day, and I want to leave you with a tip because I've been listening for two days, and all this hundred thousand dollars a month, and everybody drives a Ferrari, grand is eight thousand dollars a year. Now, Jordan, I was back there, and I got I got lasers about fifteen years ago. I got great. I got better than twenty twenty eyesight. And I swear, I could not tell the difference between your super and that. <laughs> <laughs> I will have to say that when I bring up the next speaker, you will be able to tell the difference between this suit <laughs> or his suit and mine. Uh, you know, that's where it's great. Uh, but I wanted to leave you 
good tip. I'm sitting back there listening to all this stuff, and, and uh, this, 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 you know what? These are phenomenal leaders and dead on in their training. So you can have any one of these people come to any one of your seminars, and you know, of course, they teach maybe different stuff, which wouldn't be necessarily good. But from a, from a rich, quality content standpoint, I mean, these people are dead on. Some phenomenal leaders, phenomenal trainers. Really, really good stuff. My ass off. One person a week. We'll pay you $2,500 a week 
on top of whatever you're earning now. So if you're earning $100,000 a month and you want the $2,500 a week, we'll give you $2,500 a week to personally sponsor one person a week. You only get one, you don't need to sponsor two, just one a week, $2,500 a week. So you can make 10 grand a month personally sponsoring one person a week. As soon as the app comes in with the order, the daily payout, we'll put it on your debit card, $2,500 cash. Only a couple of rules. You can't buy the kit out of the $2,500 for the new person. You have to legitimately prospect, network, sell the package. You with me? You can't bribe the new person. You just gotta keep the money, and it has to be a secret to the prospect. You can't tell the prospect that it's $2,500 for everybody who's sponsored. It's a secret, payable only to you. You with me? $2,500 a week, 10 grand a month. Every week for 52 weeks. And then another 52 weeks for the end of two years. 24 months, one person a week. At the end of 24 months, we'll pay you $10,000 a month for the rest of your life. And we won't screw it. 10 grand a month for the rest of your life. But you gotta sponsor one a week for two years. If you ever miss a week because your cat got sick, or your plane's late, or you lost your paperwork, or you got busy, or you fell asleep, you're terminated. Terminated, you can't ever come back in any of our companies and we're buying every company in. <laughs> so you're out of the whole deal forever. 10 grand a month for the rest of your life. 2,500 a week for every person you can put in. Got it? So on your paper, I want you to answer the, uh, write the answer to a question. Try to do it in one word. Try not to spend any money on the answer. Who are you going to talk to? Everybody. Really? <laughs> that easy? We were really going to fly feet or hair against the wall, I don't know. Need to degrade the professionalism of our industry in the process. 